Leadership Preparation Webinar Series, Building a Culture of High-Quality Assessment of Learning, Part 2. The Office of Leadership Development and School Improvement is comprised of an Executive Director reporting to the Assistant State Superintendent, coordinators for school improvement, academic improvement, and leadership development, as well as leadership specialists. Our office has three main goals, fostering the growth of effective leaders, ensuring valid and reliable evaluations, and raising the quality of education. We provide targeted professional learning experiences and resources to equip current and future leaders with the skills and knowledge required for successful school and district leadership. We oversee the development and implementation of Maryland's teacher and principal evaluation system. Training, guidance, and support is provided to local school systems in the implementation of fair and valid evaluations. Lastly, we provide customized professional learning experiences and support informed by data and grounded in effective practices to improve school performance. To earn continuing professional development credit, in order to receive one credit, you must view five webinars, including part one and part two. Additionally, you will complete three hours of experiences per webinar to include pre-work, participant guides with the webinar, and extension activities. In order to receive two CPD credits, you must watch all the webinars in the series, including part one and part two. Then you will complete three hours of experiences per webinar to include any pre-work, participant guides with the webinar, and extension activities. In order to submit your materials, please complete the Google form found in the description below the video. Let's meet the presenter, Robert Sheffield, Director, Center for School Turnaround and Improvement at West Ed. In part two of this session, you will learn how to leverage your assessment system to achieve your equity goals. As a part of this learning, you will learn to conduct an assessment inventory to check the alignment of your assessment system to your goals. By the conclusion of part two, you will be able to examine how leaders and teachers utilize different assessment methods and cycles to collect evidence of student learning across your school site. In this session, we will address PESOL Standard 4, Curriculum, Instruction, and Assessment. This standard says that effective educational leaders develop and support intellectually rigorous and coherent systems of curriculum, instruction, and assessment to promote each student's academic success and well-being. The application of this learning is cross-cutting and is supportive of the additional PESOL standards listed on the slide. Before we move into the content of our webinar, please consider the learning target, the success criteria, and standards, and take a moment to identify what you would hope to learn from part two of this webinar. Key concepts from part one. Here's our problem of practice in this area. With so many assessments and so much data available, are students, teachers, and leaders able to translate assessment data into improved learning outcomes? To do so, they need a system of assessment that is comprehensive and balanced, as well as time and a culture that supports using evidence of student learning for advancing equitable student outcomes. The absence of a system of assessment leads to overtesting and underutilization of information that is vital to our improvement efforts. We should also recall that our assessment systems are a subsystem within a larger teaching and learning system that also includes curriculum, instruction, and enrichment. Stakeholders within a school benefit differently from each system, and because the assessment system produces the data that you will use to guide your leadership decisions and actions, it should be the most important system to your own personal leadership. The overarching goal of both webinars is to improve our assessment leadership. Assessment leadership is the capacity to enact a comprehensive, balanced system of assessments and support a culture of assessment literacy that can use evidence of student learning to produce equitable learning outcomes for all students. 
The assessment leader understands and clearly articulates a vision for assessment anchored in a knowledge of fundamental assessment literacy concepts. They engage stakeholders to develop a complete picture of all assessments in place in order to evaluate and make decisions about a comprehensive and balanced local assessment system. Finally, they develop and implement a culture of assessment literacy in which a comprehensive, balanced system of assessment aligns to local equity goals. The assessment literate leader understands how to leverage different assessments to achieve their instructional leadership goals. The next few slides will provide a reminder of a few basic concepts on assessment methods and cycles. First, let's recall that there are four common methods of assessment. Formative assessment, interim benchmarks, summatives, or screeners and diagnostics. There are also different ways of differentiating assessment methods. Assessment can be differentiated by the following factors. Purpose, timing and frequency, scale or grain size, feedback, and finally test conditions and flexibility. Lastly, we should recall that it is important to consider the use of assessment by cycle as you plan for a year of instruction or a year of program implementation. Assessment cycles help us to operationalize assessment planning and administration, data collection and analysis, and feedback and improvement. As an instructional leader, you're responsible for this type of planning to ensure that you are collecting evidence of student learning and teacher practice at strategic points during the school year to inform your leadership actions. Among these actions will be those that support teacher professional learning and student enrichment after initial instruction. We will now focus on assessment quality. Before we launch into this section of the webinar, I would like for you to know that we will use an equity lens to develop our understanding of assessment quality. This lens will help us to use assessment as a lever to achieve your equity goals. Let's take a few moments to set our foundation. During the opening frame of part one, I laid out seven key principles of assessment that you must keep in mind. They are displayed again here. Please take a moment to scan the list to refresh your memory. When I first saw this list, each of the principles made sense on face value except for number four. The one that states, fair and supportive of fairness in equity in educational opportunity. I had to think about what that one meant based upon what I've done and seen as a teacher and leader. I've come to understand that equity has to be defined and operationalized to address educational disparities. So as we consider its application to assessment, we should frame our desire to learning around this question. How do we make our assessment practices equitable? Equity work is one of the most complex endeavors that cuts across industries and government sectors. The work must be principle-based, data-oriented, contextual, and situational. It must challenge existing systems, policies, and practices that govern society, corporations, and public institutions. Equity work is also loaded with 400 years of historical sentiment that struggles to make sense of how a nation founded on the ideals of liberty institutionalizes so many public policies to limit the liberty of so many of its citizens. This complexity demands, at times, a simple, foundational working definition of equity work to keep us focused on our overall mission. Here's the definition that I use with my teams. At its most fundamental level, equity work addresses outcome disparities that exist between groups. Fortunately for educators in Maryland, your state has done much of the heavy lifting required to define different aspects of equity work within public education through the Maryland Educational Equity Guidebook. The guidebook is organized around four equity areas. Let's take a moment to read the slide. Our learning in this webinar is grounded in focus one, academic achievement and growth, building an equitable academic program. Assessment is essential to all academic programming. 
We must therefore learn how to apply an equity lens to assessment as a step within our progression towards developing equity-centered assessment strategies for students. So what does it mean to apply an equity lens? Let's return to the foundational working definition again. At its most foundational level, equity work addresses outcome disparities that exist between groups. Due to our country's racial history and public policy decisions, disparities exist within our public school systems. To address disparities, or what we commonly refer to as gaps within education, we must learn to see how the design of our systems produce those gaps. The Maryland Educational Equity Guidebook explains how to see and address the common gaps that exist in K-12 educational systems. In Maryland, the text reads, we believe that all students are capable of reaching their full potential and succeeding in school, regardless of race, gender, socioeconomic status, or individual characteristics. As such, when there are gaps in achievement and growth based on these characteristics, we must take a close and critical look at the systems that govern schools and local school systems. Next, we must then make the changes necessary so that all students are able to reach their potential at the schools that they attend. We will continue to look critically at every aspect of our educational system until all academic and growth gaps are closed. Now that we have our equity lens in place, let's refocus on assessment. Assessment researchers and thinkers laid out steps for FAIR, or what we now refer to as equitable, assessments 20 years ago. In Susky's 2000 work, she describes seven steps that can support the development of quality assessments. These are, have clearly stated learning outcomes. Two, match your assessment to what you teach. Three, use many different measures and many different types of measures. Four, help students learn how to do the assessment task. Five, engage and encourage your students. Six, interpret assessment results appropriately. And seven, evaluate the outcomes of your assessments. These steps offer more descriptive clarity for what the term FAIR might mean in practice. If you can recall the key principles that were shared earlier, it was the fourth principle, the one speaking to fairness and equity, that offered the least amount of clarity. In 2018, Milner provided a clear vision of what equitable assessment systems can look like if we were to operationalize systems that measure what matter most. He says, we should be working toward assessments and assessment systems that help us improve our practices to support student growth and student diversity. These assessments may be written, oral, performative, art-centered, or technologically enhanced. In all cases, the important thing is for educators to learn what students are learning or not learning as we challenge them to build knowledge, attitudes, dispositions, skills, and practices. Milner continues by offering guidance to describe how we can measure what really matters in student learning. He points out five principles. First one, assessment and measurement should be used to gauge student learning development and improvement over time. Two, assessments should be used by teachers to adjust their practices, how they teach, what they teach, when they teach, and so forth, to respond to and meet the needs of students. Three, Students should not feel intimidated by assessments, but should see them as opportunities to get a snapshot, a picture of where they are and what they need to do to improve. Four, punitive assessments send the wrong message and can raise anxiety among learners, especially the ones that need our support the most. And five, perhaps most important, assessment tools should be just as diverse as the students who take them. As I've done my research and developed my practice over 20 plus years, I've come to understand that assessments that advance the causes of equity and sustain students' cultural heritage have five key overarching characteristics. Those are, these assessments promote the well-being of the whole child by measuring more than just literacy and numeracy. They are designed to leverage students' cultural funds of knowledge to promote deeper engagement and greater success. They provide students with multiple opportunities to show what they know and can do 
through different assessment methods. They produce data that allow students, families, and educators to track student growth over time. Finally, they develop agency for students and collective advocacy for teachers and school leaders. So why should we care about equitable assessments in this way? Educational leaders tend to think of data-driven decision-making as one of the key strategies to achieve equity for students. It is, but, what if your assessment strategy or your way of collecting achievement data contributes to the gap that you're trying to close? Let's look at an example from recent history. The 2001 No Child Left Behind Act established goals for reading and math, along with punitive policies for failure to achieve those goals. The pressure to achieve specific targets in reading and math led some elementary school communities to narrow their curricula in an effort to allow for more time to focus on those areas of instructions. Students within these schools lost access to social studies, science, arts, and physical education as an unintended consequence of the need to focus more time on reading and math. Scores might have improved, but the quality of the educational experience did not. To achieve equity, we must leverage the best practices available to engage students in meaningful learning that translates to outcomes that we can see and that they can own. The NCLB era thought the same, but organized itself around assessment targets that were too limited to address the well-being of children. If we want to shift that trajectory, we will need to see a broader set of assessment targets that better represent our vision for student learning within our schools. We will now transition to our culminating task for this two-part webinar series, conducting an assessment inventory. The task will require you to apply everything that we have learned so far through a practice that you can use within your instructional leadership. You will need to consider purpose, balance, and quality as you work through the inventory. The assessment inventory will allow you to see the characteristics of the assessments in use within your school. You will be able to see the methods, cycles, and uses of a set of assessments given to a grade level or student group. Once your assessments are visible to you in this way, you will have the ability to make strategic adjustments to gather less or more evidence to communicate what students are learning. An equity-centered application of this practice is to make strategic adjustments to gather less or more evidence in service of the well-being of a specific student group. As we solidify our why for conducting an assessment inventory, remember our problem of practice for this series. With so many assessments and so much data available, are students, teachers, and leaders able to translate assessment data into improved learning outcomes? The assessment inventory will position you to directly address this problem in an evidence-based way. A final point on the inventory. When enacted, this should be a team-based collaborative activity. The team should represent different perspectives on student well-being and be normed to maintain a systems orientation to address the needs of students. This webinar intends to introduce the assessment inventory as a practice to support assessment leadership. It is therefore important to conduct a brief inventory for yourself. You will have an initial view of the system and know how to plan facilitation of the team's assessment inventory. Now let's consider the instructions that will guide the assessment inventory. Step one, recall the goal, focus, or priority that you identified for activity one in the part one webinar. Step two, Identify or collect the assessments used to measure student learning for your goal, focus, or priority. Step three, use the assessment inventory template to complete an inventory of the assessments used in that context and the details about them. Step four, examine the balance of assessments in your school. To complete this activity, please go to the part two activity section of the participant guide to review the steps for the activity and to find the template and supplemental resources to support your work. You will also find a set of questions to help you to examine the balance of assessments in your school.
Here are a few points to consider as you work with the template. First, you will access the template via a link found in the participant guide. That link will direct you to a Google Sheet that you must download to your computer. To download the template, select File in the menu options, then scroll down to Download and select Microsoft Excel. If you choose to work in Google Sheets, select File in the main options, then scroll down to make a copy. Once you make a copy, you will be able to input information into the cells of the sheet. Now let's talk about how to use the template. The first prompt within the activity asks you to choose a context to conduct a sample assessment inventory in relation to the goal, focus, or priority identified in, part, in the Part 1 activity. Once you have determined your context, think about or collect a set of assessments for a grade level, content area, or student group identified within your goal. List the names of those assessments across the top of the template within the columns provided. For each assessment, you will use the prompts in the first column to provide information about each of the assessments that you have listed. The information that you will give is based upon the ways that the assessment types can be differentiated by purpose, timing, grain size, and feedback. The template will also ask you to provide a brief description and explain how the assessment data is used to inform teaching and learning. Once you have completed the template, then move to the third prompt in the participant guide. Use the questions to examine and evaluate the balance of assessments in your system. General questions are, what do you see? Which assessment types are used most frequently? Which are used least frequently? What adjustments can be made to make your system more balanced, comprehensive, and informative? How does your assessment system aid student progress towards your vision for learning? And finally, how does your assessment system possibly limit student progress towards your vision for learning? For those who wish to examine the quality of their assessment systems through an equity lens, you may use any of the tools listed here. You may also use these tools to improve the design and administration of your assessments to collect better information on what specific groups of students are learning. These tools are the key principles of assessment that can be found in part one and part two of the webinar, the seven steps to fair assessment, which can be found in part two, measuring what matters, which can also be found in part two, and finally, assessments that advance equity found in part two. I hope that you found this webinar to be informative and to have provided you with a foundational practice that you may use to evaluate the system of assessment in use within your school. This concludes part two of the webinar. Thank you and I hope that you continue to develop your competencies as an assessment leader. The Office of Leadership Development and School Improvement would like to thank you for participating in the Leadership Preparation Virtual Webinar Series. We hope you found this particular webinar informative and beneficial to your work as you prepare as a leader. To access the webinar series and find additional resources, please visit the Maryland Resource Hub. The Maryland Resource Hub can be located at Maryland resourcehub.com. That is M-A-R-Y-L-A-N-D-R-E-S-O-U-R-C-E-H-U-B dot C-O-M. We appreciate your feedback and would ask that you take a moment at this time to complete the SurveyMonkey link or use the QR code. The feedback that you provide to us will inform our work in the office as we develop additional resources to support you in the field. Again, thank you very much for your time and completing the feedback. As a reminder, the continuing professional development credits are available to you for this Leadership Preparation Webinar Series. To receive one credit, you will need to view five webinars, parts one and two, and complete three hours of experience for the webinar. That would include the pre-work, viewing the webinar, and completing the participant's guide, 
as well as extension activities related to the webinar. To receive two CPD credits, you will watch all 10 webinars, parts one and two, and complete three hours of experience per webinar. Again, it would include the pre-work, viewing the webinar and completing the participate's guide while watching, and extension activities related to the webinar. After you have completed the work, you will then submit all of the materials to the Google Form link listed. If you need to contact us with any questions for any reason at the Office of Leadership Development and School Improvement, you can contact Ed Mitzel, Executive Director at edmund.mitzel.maryland.gov. That is E D M U N D dot M I T Z E L at maryland.gov or Dr. Lori Ellis, Coordinator for Leadership Development at lori.ellis at maryland.gov. That is L O R I dot E L L I S at maryland.gov.